What do you say we get to this episode with Petrucci, Petrucci from Dream Theater? Now on to the show. My friend, the lead singer of Hate Breed, the infamous and notorious Jamie Jasta is in the building. That's what's up. Dude just want to pick coffee, death metal, and push-ups. Oh, yeah. that impress me, bro. I probably shouldn't say this on the podcast, but... I would say delete that. That shit is hard. <laughs> What's up, everybody? Welcome to the show. This is episode 430. I got the riff beast himself, Mr. John Petrucci from Dream Theater in <laughs> the house. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you hear the you hear Lars's dad in the new intro? <laughs> I, I love that. That was awesome. <laughs> yeah, we're like we we made these tribute shirts to Lars's dad where he says delete that. <laughs> it just says delete that on it. I gave one to Jim Brewer. You know, he's out with yeah. Metallica now, so I'm I'm hoping he wears it. Right. We did some Lars is right shirts too. Lars was right. We did those shirts, and he saw those. Yeah. Like, fans have been wearing them to the meet and greet, and he's yeah. been Instagramming them, so. Gotcha. Hopefully he knows, you know. We appreciate what he did, what he tried to do for us. Yeah. I saw a cool, cool thing where uh, Cliff's dad was in the audience. and No he way. He went down and, like, you know, introduced him to everybody, and it was pretty cool. The show is yeah. amazing. Actually, I'm going up to, to Brewer's gig tonight to get him back on the podcast, but I was watching all the videos from the tour, yeah. and I thought, this is... It's already happening where rock bands are taking more comedians out. Yeah. But that is really unique the way they're That's doing it awesome. with him. That's amazing. Would you guys ever do that? Sure. Absolutely. We did, you know, th- obviously he's not a comedian at all. <laughs> but we did a tour where uh, my buddy Andy McKee was opening for us, who's a, a solo guitar, acoustic guitar player. Yeah. But it was so different because he's so unique. It wasn't a band opening for us. Um, and people loved it. Yeah, he could, it could be like a storyteller's type of vibe. It was so cool. You know, yeah. like I said, he's not a comedian, um, but I, the idea of having something different as an opening as opposed to just like another band or two bands or something, I think is awesome. Yeah. It's a great idea. It makes like the show have even more impact because you're not just being bombarded by like right, band this... after band after riff after riff. You know? Have you noticed yeah. that like this, the, the fans want similar styles of bands on the tours? Oh, yeah. And I, I always thought that that was strange. It is strange. By the time the, <laughs> the headliner comes out, you're like, uh, I'm sick of this. <laughs> yeah, especially with my band. Yeah. I don't know what it is. They always want bands that sound exactly like my band. And I'm yeah. thinking, don't you want to have like a, like a variety during the night? <laughs> Man, when we, like, a, when we first started doing festivals in Europe, it was the epitome of like all weird combinations. I want to say like maybe 95 or so. We'd go over there and we're playing like Munich stadium and it's like Joe Cocker, Cheryl Crow, <laughs> you know, Rod Stewart yep. and dream theater. You know, it's like, what, what, what are we doing here? But in, in a way it was like so much cooler than like the Prague festival. It's like, you're just hearing the same thing. Yeah. Over and over. We did a, we did a festival in uh, Norway one time and we got there and you know, we have, we had flown in and everybody's like destroyed. Yeah, and, sure. We couldn't check into the room, so we just went right to the festival site and we just waited, waited to play. <laughs> and that we were like, all right, let's see who's on the bill. Since we're here, let's yeah. go check out some bands. They're like, it's you, Three Doors Down, <laughs> and Mary J. Blige. And that's it. There's no- <laughs> Amazing. And it was packed. But that's cool, though. It was so cool. I think that's way better. And then yeah. like Mary J. Blige's crew and some of the people that were working for Three Doors Down like mm-hmm. checked us out and then I think even we ended up hanging with the guys from Three Doors Down because we were both on Universal and they were like ragers like good old boys like really cool dudes that we were so cool. we had a lot in common with and it, yeah. it ended up being like the audience liked everybody Yep, which was wild because that's amazing their radio and their TV yeah. doesn't uh, divide it up right. by genre right. it's just all music Yeah, which is interesting because it's like it kind of in a weird way, it kind of proves that media conditions people to think. I think so. Certain things. Yeah. Which is a whole, we could do a whole podcast. That's, yeah, exactly. But uh, but I love that. That's so cool. Yeah, it was really fun. And I stayed and watched. I didn't realize how many hits Mary J. Blige had. I was like, she sings this one. It's crazy. We've been that, you know, on, on uh, festivals like that. And, be, and sometimes there's like a band that you like kind of in a very ignorant way never heard of, you know. And you and you're like, who are these guys, and why are they so huge? And the whole audience is singing. Yep. Um, I forget the name of this one band from like Europe that was like 
why? How does everybody know every single song? And I've never heard of these guys. Uh, probably Sabaton or someone like that. It wasn't a metal. It was like a pop, like a oh, like Di- Ditoten Hosen. Yeah, we always no we always play with them, and the whole audience knows every yeah. word. I like that one, Ruskaya. Do you ever play with them? No, no. Oh, they're like wild polka rock. Oh, wow. They got horns, I think. Yeah. They had one of the biggest circle pits I've ever seen, and it was literally like a polka circle pit. I was like, Oh my god! I've seen everything now. I remember the band. It wasn't metal at all. It was Status Quo. Okay, yeah. And I'm like, at the time, who the hell? Like literally, the place was singing along. Like, you know, it was like the equivalent of a Long Island Billy Joel concert. Yeah. You know, I'm like, how does everybody know every single word? And I've never heard of these guys. They were UK, I yeah. think, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, back to the comedian thing, the the Craig Gass, who's been on the podcast, he's done like the Monsters of Rock cruise, mm-hmm. I think, and Don Jameson is out with Pop Evil right now, and he's going out with Anvil. He's going to be the support act for Anvil. Wow. Who I almost booked once back in my promoter days, and I remember they're like, all right, your contact is going to be Lips. <laughs> and I was like, that's the best name Perfect. for a rock dude. But, um, but Craig had tweeted something funny this morning, and I was thinking, oh, I should... I should do a segment like for the funniest tweets or the best responses to yeah. tweets. And because he goes, has anybody famous ever been a dick to you? And I was reading the responses and someone wrote, <laughs> someone wrote, my mom mistook CeCe DeVille for Rod Stewart. You brought up Rod Stewart. Oh, so it made no. me think of it. <laughs> and he goes, no, I'm not fucking Rod Stewart. I'm Tom Thumb or whatever. But he was so pissed about it. I would oh, think that is hilarious. God. That'd be awesome, actually. <laughs> but but has anybody mistaken you for someone else, or is or and the second yes. has any famous person been a dick to you? Well, I, w- one time the band uh, went out. We were in uh, Houston, I think, and we all went out to dinner at Morton's Steakhouse, and uh, you know we're all sitting around this big table, and uh, we start to kind of just notice it's like kind of Secret Service guys around, us. and uh, unbeknownst to us, right behind us was uh george bush senior no way r.i.p and his wife barbara the two of them and uh he was in a wheelchair and he's hanging out and uh somebody's like yeah the president wants to say hi so he's like shut so, the I fuck swear to God. up so so she so first <laughs> barbara bush comes over and she's like she was like a you know had all this personality and everything she was like so funny she's like yeah, we're wondering, are you guys wrestlers? <laughs> like she didn't <laughs> I wonder which one they thought you were. I don't know. I don't Macho know. man. Or... I don't know. But we said said hi to and he and he did like the power handshake, like from a wheelchair with like one hand and then the other one on your shoulder. And you're like, Holy shit, this is like you no know, way. The present. And then she, we're like, You should come to the show and everything. And Barbara's like, Can I bring a date? <laughs> like <laughs> So and yeah, we were That's mistaken amazing. for wrestlers. Yeah. That's amazing. Wow, Morton's getting the high profile Morton's, clientele. That's right. The, but was anybody a dick? Uh probably. <laughs> not not GWB no. senior. That's no, he was great, yeah. So so he gave you a firm handshake. Yeah, you wouldn't want I mean the guy was like jumping out of planes and shit. Like he was an actual he was a president that actually put in time yeah, serving the country. Exactly, exactly. It was it was crazy. That was is crazy. amazing. Yeah. Did you get a picture with him? No, we didn't. I don't know why. Uh, Pre cell phone camera days. No, this was like not not too long ago. Really? Yeah. I don't know why we didn't get a picture. I don't know. Maybe it felt weird or something. I've been I've been doing like pretty much the vegetarian thing. But yeah. man, you bring up Morton's and I'll <laughs> tell me what you get first, and then I'll tell you what I would get. Well, I, normally I'd get a New York strip. Really? Yeah. But I was like not too long ago. I used to steer away from like the ribeye because. It was too fatty, like yeah. To me. But not too long ago, uh, one of my best friends cooked it in a way and like sliced it that it was like this is the best thing ever. So if it, if a steakhouse has like a good tomahawk, like really thick ribeye, and they steak they slice it, that's what you go for. That's the shit. See, I, before I did the first Jost album, I I took everybody. I think it was Randy and Randy from Lamb of God and Phil from All the Remains. I think we all went out to Morton's in Hartford. Yeah. because we did the show at the Webster. Yeah, the record release show. And I got, I think I do the eight ounce filet, but I always nice. get like blue cheese uh, or I'll get, you know, hollandaise. And then I just do veggies. I don't do a potato. I'll do like two sides, like broccoli, asparagus. Gotcha. But yeah, I can't, I, I don't know. The, the whole grass fed thing I would do maybe once a year, but right. 
I don't want to do for whatever reason. I don't know. Maybe it's I'm conditioned by the media, but yeah. I don't want to do corn fed or grain fed. I don't want to know what they're eating. To be honest with you, yeah. Like, I, what, <laughs> when I look at a menu and it's like you know free range grass, I, like I don't know what the I don't want to know the life they lived before. I just want to eat it. Yeah. <laughs> I, see, don't, I, I don't need the descriptives. <laughs> yeah, see, hopefully my daughter doesn't listen to this because she's been like, you've been so good about being, you know, not eating animals. I'm like, I'm I know, I'm, tr- I'm trying. I'm no, trying. believe me, my both my daughters are vegan. So Yeah, so you know, I, get it. I open yeah. the fridge and I'm like, what is this? Why? It's like <laughs> marinated soybeans and all. I guess I guess if you're going to eat soy, it's, it's good to eat it like fermented. Mm-hmm. So, uh Tempe. I mean, they make some stuff that's really good. I got. Yeah. I. I will admit that. There's. I had this uh, Impossible Burger. And... Yeah. Those. We have the Beyond Burgers. And okay. All yeah. That stuff. And, you know, it's funny because it's like now holidays and stuff. It's like my wife's cooking two different like versions of the yes. meal. Yeah. For Thanksgiving, I had this like field roast or fake. Yeah, like, you had, had field roast. <laughs> you did. It wasn't bad. I had I, fake I gravy it. on it. Yeah. Like yeah, it? it was. I, I thought it was pretty good. Yeah, yeah, but but I again, I think with soy, I don't know, it does something to me. Kind of like ah. I was having to go outside and rip, just rip ass outside, <laughs> like bad, like just it's like frozen yogurt. <laughs> <laughs> um. So I listened to the album on the way down, cool. and I, the last time you were on the podcast, I think I listened to the last album on my way over to Oakdale, but I didn't. I didn't really. I don't think I really absorbed it. Yeah. This album, I was just, maybe I just had a intense focus because I was on the train and I was, yeah. you know, I, I didn't, I put the phone down, put the, closed the computer. I love that. Perfect. It was great. And I really was impressed. I thought, I was first of all, so happy that you're coming with riffs. Yeah. And riffs that are discernible, yeah. that come back later right. in the song. And I know you've done that before, sure. but you do have songs that, you know, are more sort of, I guess classical type of arrangements that build on ideas right. and right is that is that yeah fair? exactly a lot of our arrangements you know, to a lot of our songs are kind of really non-conventional like you might not hear the same part twice yeah type of thing which is fun and it creates kind of this weird thing where you never know what's around the next turn yeah it's like a roller coaster in the dark it's like space mountain yeah music. and sometimes i am in that mood yeah where i want that right. where i don't want to yeah uh, know the structure. Yeah, yeah. I, I like being able to turn off like the producer musician kind of ear, which not that I'm this, you know, no, but authority. You can't, you can't help but listen to music that way when you're, in, you know, in that you know field. You're gonna your mind's immediately gonna go to like the production or this or the songwriting or the lyric. You know, yeah. It's hard to like just, you know, have this perspective of non judgment. You know, it's tough to get in that headspace. So it's great that. You can do that. It it is, and I just watched uh, Bohemian Rhapsody. Yeah, me too. I saw it recently. Did you like it? I liked it. Yeah, yeah I liked it I liked a lot. It. I thought the guy did a really good job, yeah, and, me I, and too. I thought they were pretty realistic. I they ha- I could tell they really needed to edit it down to fit. Yeah. Um. I was like, I was thinking, man, they really sort of got really to this place in the film. I don't want to no spoilers because I know a lot of people that haven't seen it sure. yet. I mean, obviously, you know what happened. It's a tragedy. Yeah. What happened to Freddie Mercury? But as far as the music aspect and dealing with the label, I thought that was pretty realistic. Yeah. And, you know, listening to your new record, even though some of the songs are six minutes plus, I thought you could have a couple radio hits with this record. If the, if yeah. Sony, how does it work with Inside Out? Could Sony upstream it or 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 put some marketing behind it and say, you know what, Dream Theater is... Uh, they're 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 legends. They're a legacy act. Let's take this to radio. Right. Well, I mean, th- this is all new for us as far as our relationship with Inside Out and Sony. Okay. So, th- you know, we just signed with them. This is our first um, experience. They've been wonderful. They've been unbelievable. Actually, the guy who signed us, Thomas Weber, has been a Dream Theater fan for a long, long time. Like, Great. he came to our first show when we came over to Europe uh, in Germany, and he's been amazing. So we'll see. I mean, I, I think that there are some songs on the record that could go that way. So we'll see if the power behind it will we'll push it. You know, um, I, I we were having this conversation in the car ride over. And, uh, you know, it, it's hard. You can't really force that stuff. And even if you do everything exactly right, your team is great. And every, it's a matter of, you know, how's, how is it going to hit people? Right. You if know? it organically starts exactly. to get legs. Right. And then they look for markers like, oh, this 
tastemaker station added it and they got the phones blew up and but i just think if you're gonna and this is just maybe this is me just being the sort of jaded guy who's yeah. dealt with a lot of label people who've said to me no and meanwhile now they're out of jobs you know how many and, times that's <laughs> happened oh my god the, the conversations yeah where you you hang up and you're so frustrated how did you have control over my the outcome of of something that was important to yeah. me but yet I'm still here doing it. <laughs> right. And you're long gone. Yeah. yeah. And no That's offense true. to them because I, I I realize that a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And, and it really does come down to the song and the yeah. artist. Is the artist reliable? Is the song amazing? Is right. it a hit? But there's a couple songs on here that I really thought, man. And I went back and listened to the first four songs again because I had enough time yeah. between whatever, Stamford and, yeah, and yeah. here. And I those those really i thought man did you did you decide that in the sequencing like to front load it like that you know it's it's funny the way that worked out you know the first of all i just want to comment that i'm so glad that you listened to it on the train and did that because when we went in to write this record um after coming off of doing like a two album two hour and 15 minutes worth of music i'm like let's make a record people could work out to or yes. listen to like on a car ride or something it's a it's perfect that you said that um, but as far as the sequence and how it just happened to happen that the first few songs were the first few single, it, I don't know. It's a weird yeah, coincidence, I guess. You're coming strong. Yeah. I, I like to say hard because yeah. there are some hard riffs. Yeah. And I was really happy about that. Cool. I feel like this record is for, for fans like me who are sort of on the, uh, the heavier side of things. Sure. I do. I will always check out what certain bands in the prog or rock or right. uh, even some of the instrumental bands i'll always check them out but maybe not every record is um to my liking like even like with maiden yeah there's ones that i would just i don't go to yeah sure Hey everybody, it's Jamie jumping in with a quick interruption here to remind you that today's episode is brought to you by indiemerchstore.com and indie merch is thrilled to announce that they have a full range of cradle of filth merchandise now available at IndieMerchStore.com. Tons of classic albums, shirts, long sleeves, hoodies, hats, and more. The most controversial <laughs> Cradle of Filth design is also available. I think you know which one I'm talking about. Don't wear it to the bank or the post office, especially not to church. IndieMerchStore.com. Check it out. They're giving 15% off your order when you use the coupon code JOSTA15. So you'll help this podcast and you'll help out a great independent merch store, IndieMerchStore.com. Don't forget, Cradle of Filth is going out on a headlining tour this March. So check the tour dates, baby. Now back to the podcast. The other day I was going through and I listened to that, uh, I think it's off Wicker Man, Brave New World. Okay, yeah, I know that and one. I'm like, this yeah. is a hit. Yeah. Like a later in the career hit. Right, right. And so I feel like with this record, you guys have a couple of those types of songs where you're going to get these people who might be on the... I don't want to say fringes, but yeah. like the outskirts of casual rock and metal yeah. fans who yeah. are going to hear this, and I think really it's going to resonate well, with them. Well, that's great to hear. I mean, the, the way that we made this album, just the band went away to a remote location. We did like a guy's trip, you know. Where? And, yeah, we, we were in um, Monticello. No way. Yeah, yeah so by uh, Woodstock. Okay. And uh, we rented this barn and, and a house on like five acres. And uh, the barn was originally built and owned by uh, Ryuchi Sakamoto. He like he scored the Revenant. Oh, and amazing! He, yeah, and then he sold it, and there's this empty shell of like a studio. And, like he scored it there. I don't know. That's a good question. Was there music in the bear rape scene, or or no? I wonder. Like I don't think there was, but bears visited us at that studio. Get so the bears fuck came out. up to the door. So I thought it, they were coming back to pay a visit. I wow. don't know. The jury's out on that one. But but uh, my point is, like, the way that we were just hanging out, we brought all our live gear into this amazing barn that sounded unbelievable. And it's like everything was cranking. The guitars were, like, bouncing off the wood. The drums were loud. And so you just get into this primal mode where, like, I grab my seven string or, you know, and you're just playing these riffs that feel good. Yeah. Because it sounds so good. And, and, the more like groove intensive, heavier type riffs just feel right. They in that, absolutely in that environment when all the guys are on full, you know, all cylinders. It sounds good, and you know, there's a little bourbon over there. And you just play. <laughs> it's like 
it just feels right. So the album came out that way, I think, because of the way that we did it. Loud amps in the face. It's nothing That's, like it. You can, you're not going to have that sound and then come up with some wimpy, right. you know, guitar yeah. lick. And also, <laughs> I really like that. I felt like it had a real opener and closer. Because even in my yeah. caveman sure. world, I like that. Like, I like when... That's totally true. I like when I see a band yeah. and they're, they open with a new song. Like, yes. here we go. We're confident. Yes. Boom. And I felt like the first four you could open with. Yeah. Well, you know, again... I mean, we, we've been doing, this is our 14th studio album and we're definitely like sort of hanging on to the old school. Like people listen to an album, like an album, like you did. It's kind of like you take the time, like you're watching a, you know, whether it's an episode of Black Mirror or a full movie, like you just, you're watching the whole thing. So you're listening to the whole thing. So that album has to exist as like an experience. So the opener is like an the opener of, you know, a, a movie film. or a show that has drama, you know, sucks you in, takes you on a ride. And then the ending is like a big climactic scene. Yeah. As the story leaves you kind of like, yeah, holy shit, you know, wondering. That's that's the way we sequence records when we make them, you know. But the idea is that people will listen to this as one piece, you know. For sure, yeah. yeah. And James is so good at at enunciating and, and he's clear. Cool where I didn't need to pull up the lyrics. I'm great. I, I'm, I'm really happy because we, we try to get his Canadian accent out of him <laughs> as much as we can. <laughs> um, Untethered Angel, too, like especially that one, I just was feeling the groove and the riffs were so tasty. And then the, that sort of, I don't. I wanted to know like what you call things because I'm finishing my Jost album right now and yeah. I'm, I'm running out of ideas like where I go, what is this? Is this a bridge or is this a second bridge? Or sure. Is this bridge two? Like, is this a reprise of a right. the chorus? Well, how do you name it. Yeah. yeah, like what do you call all those other sections? Well, we we like to be creative, and sometimes we have like our engineer like will come up with funny names like when we're kind of mapping out the song. But in Untethered Angel, there's like a after the second chorus, it's kind of a really tight band unison, almost like Latiny kind of thing. Yeah. So we call that like the Dimiola section, like Al Dimiola. So, but before that, like the lead up to it, it's the premiola section. Because it's, <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So, so it's like yeah. whatever kind of make, you know, usually we name sections by like the band or whatever that it kind of reminds us of. And that like puts everybody in the same, you know. Yeah. Like we once had in the song, like the Jesus Jones section, you know, you never, you never know. Who's <laughs> Shout the- out to <laughs> Jesus Jones. What was their hit? Oh uh, God! Can you look that up, Ryan? Uh, it's when when you when he tells us it's going to be. So I obvious. know it's going to be right. It's right on the tip of my tongue. You know what I listened to right before I listened to your record? What's that? The Romantics. Oh yeah. I hear the yeah. secrets that you keep. Da, 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 yeah. Right. Yeah. And then what was their hit like twenty years before that? They didn't they have multiple. They had so many hits because we were Kirk from Crowbar. We we're always joking around how we want to have him do. Like uh, the old one sings the hits, like yeah. a karaoke with that g- gargly. Oh He's like the heavy metal Joe Cocker. Right. So like, right? Is it, would you? What uh, was it? What band do you look for? Uh, Jesus Jones. What was that big hit they had? Right here, right now. Uh, right here, right now. Yes. We had it. We had a Jesus Jones section. Um, but I was there's another. Look up the other Romantics hit it's hard to believe that it's the same band yeah but i will air drum the shit yeah out of those two hits of theirs what was is it um fuck it's right on the tip of my tongue i don't want to lose your talking in your sleep no that was the one but then i listened to the other one the old one what was their other hit their big hit it's even bigger than that that was kind of like an 80s like that was when they went sort of more pop and less rock is it what I like about you? What I like, I like about, about you. you. That's a smash. Can yeah. you imagine Kirk doing that? What I like <laughs> about you. You keep me warm at night. That'd be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure Lemmy probably did that with his right. other band at some yeah. point, right? Um, it almost sounds like a Headfield kind of yeah. <laughs> phrasing. <laughs> it does. Right? Right, before yeah. you, right before you walked in, there they must have had the speakers on out here, like really loud, and yeah. they hit something, and it just went, dang. And we were like, dun dun dun. <laughs> right, right. We we're like, how amazing is that? You could hear a One. half of a second. Isn't that incredible? <laughs> and know what song and know it what is. Know what song it is. It's amazing. Uh, so, have you ever had writer's block? Like, have you ever felt like I'm done? I'm out of ideas. 
I mean, like, I would say yes and no. V- very temporary. Like, where, you know, it just takes, like, you getting up, go to the bathroom, and then it's, you know, it's over. Really? That's it? Yeah. And I don't have, like, extreme versions of that. Okay. Um, and either does the band collectively. Like, every this, we have too many ideas, like, usually, like, that we don't even use. That everybody's submitting. Yeah. But I did once write a song about nothing because I wasn't sure what to write about. <laughs> really? Well, I so, I was like, like Seinfeld. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> I, I was listening to the record and just thinking like, man, where did this like creative role come from? I guess mm-hmm. it, just because you got out there, there was no distractions. Exactly. And then it just flowed. It just flows at that point. I mean, everybody comes in with like some collection of ideas. I mean, we had uh, some ideas from sound checks that we hung on to and we could reference. I had some ideas on my phone, some riffs and stuff. Um, and so the other guys, but generally it's just like, once you start going, you know, the floodgates open. Oh, it's ridiculous. Um, ridiculous. I went out there to do a podcast with Ben from Converge. Mm -hmm. I I had just gotten a new car and I was like, you know what? I'm going to take this fucker like on the highway. Cause the guy was selling me on how fast it would go and all this stuff. And, and I, I said to Ben, all right, I'll come up and we'll do the podcast and then I'll, you know, circle around into mass and then I'll drive back to Connecticut. When I got up to Woodstock, as that's where he lives, yeah. I was like, "This is amazing! It's yeah. so nice out there." I was—he really was nice telling me, like, what he got his house and his property for, oh, and I'm like, "I'm it. like, that gets me like a fucking oh, yeah. by in Connecticut that gets me literally like a 1,100 square foot little yeah. house." Yeah. And uh, and it, it it was really nice, but I could see that that could be advantageous to to creativity and. And you know, we we were looking for a place like in the mountains or something that would just be peaceful, no distractions, um, you know, great scenery, whatever, just to kind of unwind and just let the music come out. So that was like the perfect area. And you have your techs bring up all the gear. You do yeah. like a little bit of pre-production. I mean, you know what? They're amazing because like we walked into the place and everything was set up. And no way. It was so beautiful. Like, you know... It, I can't like speak enough to that, like how those guys are so great. Did you put up like uh, posters no, or like no. tapestries? No, no, it was funny. Well, the, the, on the property there was uh, a little like farmhouse, and it had just enough. It only had room for four to sleep, so one guy had to sleep like in the barn, which was a separate building. So it's kind of like who's going to sleep in the barn? You know, it might be kind of <laughs> scary at night. But bears um, scratching, yeah, bears again. and like ghosts. But Mangini. Uh, volunteered and he was the way that the barn was uh you go upstairs and that was the control room looking down so since we were just writing there we weren't using the control room so we made that a bedroom okay so we'd hang out and you know we'd be done and uh it'd be getting kind of late and i'd be listening back to the tracks and mike would be up there it's like how much longer are you gonna be <laughs> man? I gotta sleep <laughs> it's past my bedtime yeah, exactly that would be me yeah um, in the uh, in the track, I want to say it's uh, Barstool Warrior. Yes. That hit me like a ton of bricks. Oh, just cool. Listening to the story and just, I think everybody knows somebody like that yep. in their town. Yeah. Did, like, did you, were you privy to the subject matter on that? Or well, did you just sort of hear it after the fact? It, here's the funny thing about that song. Like, yeah, first of all, the, this is such a weird thing. I'm sure you deal with this all the time like, when, you know, things come out online and like you see people's reactions to stuff and you kind of makes you scratch your head. So like one of the, the funny things was when the song titles were introduced, people are like Barstool Warrior. What the hell is that? Like, that's the stupidest title I've ever yeah. like. It's like it's like a Dropkick Murphy yeah, song. Right. or something. <laughs> it's like, Give it a chance. <laughs> you haven't heard it yet. But um, we wrote that song. It, you know, it's, it has like a real old school prog. It's kind of like Rush meets uh genesis kind of vibe to it right and so you know to me i'm a bit big peter gabriel fan and i love like the old school genesis where he'd like tell stories and stuff so when we were like going over like the melodic content for the vocals i just started jokingly singing about you know there's a guy in the corner you know sipping on his just as a joke and then everybody was like that's cool like so i just went with the idea and made a story no way. So you wrote the story. Yeah. So That's I wrote a story incredible. about Yeah. So it's about two different characters that are unrelated, but they're kind of in these dead end situations. Yeah. And how to kind of get out of it. But you're right. Everybody knows somebody like that, right? Seriously. Townie bar guy that just like, I could have been a contender. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I had one of those places literally right down, like two blocks yeah. from where I moved into with my grandparents mm -hmm. uh, in the in the early 90s. Yeah. And I remember like my father going there to get my uncle out of there or going there to get a family friend out of there. Yeah, yeah. And like every time I go past the place, it's no longer there. It actually burnt down uh, mysteriously. Right, perfect. <laughs> for for yeah. you probably some sort of insurance scam or whatever. Yeah. But every time I go past there, I remember those scary nights of people yelling, oh, where man. is he? He's out there. And, He's down at, I don't want to say the name yeah, of the place. Exactly. but No, I had that growing up. There was like a, a towny bar thing. And also growing up on Long Island, like I kind of like painted this picture of like the marina, like little like, you know, worn out little bar, like by the water, the dockside and the guys in there like, you know, slumped over like. Yes. Drinking, you know. And 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 my father, you know, knew we had it in us. So like yeah. when we would drive by there in, in the backseat of the car and yeah. we would see the 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 boozos out front yeah. making trouble or, yeah. or or you know barely walking or holding on to the wall this yeah, is yeah. this is why we don't drink you right. never end up like that you right, never right, of course right. then i get into a band and i'm like yeah. <laughs> pounding 40s yeah. and i learned the hard way yeah sure but yeah that was a, that was a really cool song and it, i didn't realize that uh you write the lyrics yes so that's incredible yeah. so yeah. and you never share that duty ever no, we I, we do. We we kind of all contribute. I, I would say I write a lion's share of the lyrics um, and always have, but um, James writes and uh, so does John Myung. And on this record, Mike Mangini actually wrote his first lyric after eight years in the band. Now. Really? Yeah, for Room 137, which is cool. a trippy, trippy story. Yeah. He wrote about. What, yeah, what is that one about? Well, that's free. Well, you got to know Mike to like appreciate it. Okay. He's all into like, math and numbers and science and everything so we're like writing the song we come up with this riff that that almost has like a like a swing marilyn manson kind of vibe to it and it's like yeah i think the tempo of this should be 137 beats per minute we're like why <laughs> it's so specific yeah why and he's like well there's this whole he, he starts to tell us a story about a uh, a physicist named wolfgang Pauli who was obsessed with this number 137. It, it like repeats all throughout the universe, like a prime number, like pi or something. Oh, this is great. I got to yeah. look this up. Yeah, it's crazy. And it's like something to do with the Kabbalah and all this stuff. But anyway, he, he couldn't, he, it, he drove himself nuts trying to figure out the, why it keeps repeating all over the universe. And he kind of got into the occult and everything. Anyway, long story short, he ended up dying in hospital room 137. Shut the fuck yeah, up. Yeah, so it's called room 137. So that's Mike's <laughs> brain of the first lyric that he contributed. That's to cool. Yeah. Hey, everybody, it's Jamie jumping in with a quick interruption to let you know today's episode is brought to you by Infinite CBD. They are offering the cleanest, healthiest, and purest form of CBD available. CBD gives you the benefits of marijuana but does not get you high. It's a natural ingredient taken from hemp plants. It's 100% legal. It's not going to show up on a drug test unless, of course, you, you use 4,000 milligrams, which I don't suggest anybody use. Always check with a healthcare professional before starting a new supplement. But check it out. CBD gives you so many benefits. I use it at night for anxiety, also just to get help get better sleep, little aches and pains, bumps and bruises it helps with. But I know people who use it for inflammation. I know people who use it for a variety of different reasons. And Infinite CBD offers vape juice, gummies, capsules. I, I really like the Freezing Point Topical Cream, especially if I've walked like 10 miles in New York City and my feet are sore or my calves are sore, I can rub it right in and it's great for injuries and sore muscles. Check out InfiniteCBD.com after the podcast. That is InfiniteCBD.com. Use the promo code JOSTA15 and you will get 15% off your purchase. And you know everybody's raving about their vegan gummies, okay? No gelatin in them okay they are totally vegan so don't worry about war horse he's not ground up and put into your gummies don't worry about spirit right was that the one the disney one <laughs> don't worry about spirit he's not in your gummies infinitecbd.com use the coupon code josta15 now back to the show so when you write lyrics do you have an idea of the phrasing and the cadence mm -hmm. and like the melody or does james handle that no i do i mean some of that stuff is written like while writing the music it's sort of like embedded in the, you know, I don't know, guitar line or piano part or something. And then um, what we'll do is we'll get together. So me, James, Jordan, and we'll just sort of hum along melodies and try to come up with stuff as a guideline. 
do you ever yeah. try to fit the words into the melody or do yeah. you because i've been trying to do that on the handful of little melodic sure. parts that i have on uh melodic vocal parts on uh on this new jossa record and i i find that I'll just do a blah blah blah, yeah, and then I'll come back to it because yeah. I don't want to lose that creative process by saying, "Oh, does this word make sense with the sentence or make sense with the topic?" Right, right. Um, I even found that some a couple songs on this record, I I ended up like Howard Jones is from Killswitch Engage, who used to be in Killswitch Engage. He's so good at like not having that block where he'll write out a whole song, yeah, and it'll make sense in the context of you know, the topic and this sure. is the verse and this is going to be the course. And like, I can't, I never do it like that. Yeah, I always, amazing. I'll come up with a chorus first and then I'll write the verses around that. And gotcha. then, and then I'll, you know, like I, I reached out to a guitar player saying, Hey, I don't have a bridge. Like I hit a wall Yeah, and he sent me a bridge on his phone and it was like magic. Amazing. It, it fit. That's great. It was, it I was do a lot of that sort of stream of consciousness writing. That's really helpful as like an initial, initial way to get a song lyric down. But like, you know, if, if you have like a really great melody and you're trying to fit words to the melody, I, I kind of I'm up for the challenge of that, because I think as a lyricist, there's always a, another way to say something. You know, if you think, oh, I came up with the perfect word, but it's one syllable on any three syllables. It, it's not it's not a dead end. Yeah. If you just like spend the creative time, there is a way to do it. There is. There and always is. You know what I noticed too, which I need, I had a real like learning experience yesterday in the studio doing a joke song mm -hmm. with Howard where, where he's coming in Friday to do it. It's, we have this fake stoner band called Black Alpaca. Nice. Because we did this <laughs> like silly web show where we were going around at this like long story short, we basically went around at a petting zoo. Yeah, and we we're like the the alpacas metal, and I, I said, you know, like you got that new Black Alpaca album, like uh, it would be a stoner band. Right, right, right. But it's, because it was a joke song, mm -hmm. I did it like he does it, where I just wrote it all out. Yeah, and then I fit, I just wrote the melodies on the spot over the existing riffs. Gotcha. And it was so liberating. That's awesome. To not be like, oh, I gotta, I don't want to put this word here. I don't want to do it like this. I gotta come back. I just. Yeah. Because I guess I wasn't taking it so seriously. Yeah. In a way. Right. It Well, it, it goes back to what we were talking about with Barstool Warrior. Like, I was singing it as a joke. Like, right. With the guys. I was like, this is about a guy in a townie bar. And I started singing. But it turned out to actually be something to work with and to, to uh, you know, expand upon. So sometimes you're right. When you kind of take, you take away all those self-inflicted restrictions. Yeah. Flows and, a lot better. And you you got a topic that you've never in yeah. the history of Dream Theater really touched on. That's true. Right? With alcoholism and lost well, opportunities. And... I shouldn't say that, no, because we definitely touched on that a lot with Portnoy. He wrote, he had right. this thing, of the idea of writing 12 step, 12 songs in a series of suites. So we definitely addressed the topic, but mine was kind of more about, there's a second character in that where it's a woman who's in an abusive relationship. Right. She's like, why am I staying in this? So it's kind of more about like people having a realization and, and figuring out a way to get out of it. Yeah. And to kind of, you know, take control of their lives and less about the actual, you know, topic of alcoholism and stuff like that. Yeah, no, yeah. it was, it was powerful stuff yeah. for sure. <laughs> there was, um, I, I want maybe it was in Paralyzed uh -huh. where there's this like Roto Tom section. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or is it the song after that? I I, I don't know. There's lots. Mike Mike uses the uh, his uh, little octobon. Okay. Do they still? I didn't know if I, yeah. I didn't know if that term was correct. The Roto Toms were a specific type of drum. <laughs> yeah. That was okay. Like old school. Yeah. But do they sound similar? I think they're. I mean, they're just small drum. You know, they're just like small diameter drums with long. Uh, uh, what's it called? Canisters. Yeah, or, yeah what exactly. It, yeah. Yeah, whereas the Rototoms were like a weird flat thing on a like <laughs> well, this weird stand. Yeah, it's so, so I, funny. So I, I started thinking, I'm like, who had the best Rototoms <laughs> of all time? And I so I went down a whole Rototom like rabbit hole in my mind where I was Perfect. thinking like, imagine if if Roto was the brand name. Yeah. Can you look that up and, st and see if they're still around? And like, imagine like just being, working at like, roto tom <laughs> drums and being like we need some we need a new artist like some hip-hop artist to right. use it yeah 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 Who's to bring it back <laughs> to bring it back because because <laughs> who had it like who had the best ones was it did alex van halen have them well Ever? He, he might be another guy that had they were more of like the 
I, I don't, I'm like, I sound stupid right now because I can't think of what the, <laughs> I know what you're trying are, to. Are they octobons? Like, what do you call like the lo- small diameter drums with the long shell? I don't know, but it's we need to look up <laughs> bands that used either or roto. I just remember well, back when we first started, Mike had them when we were young kids. He had the roto toms. He sure. did. Yeah. Fuck. We need to dig those out. Yeah. What if we brought that back into like, like I could see Slayer getting if they do one last record. <laughs> Like let Gary write what yeah. the fuck? Let Gary write a record, but uh, or Exodus. Like just give me one. Could you imagine though? It could also ruin a part, like an Angel of Death. Like if it, <laughs> dun, 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 brrr, right, right, like perfect. Just we should make our own edits of famous drum fills where we add in roto toms. Someone can do that hopefully at home and and send it to us for a funny or segment. a montage of the best roto tom fills yes ever created. Cause, cause half hour straight, <laughs> Toto, or there's got to be somebody that was using Roto Toms that we that we're we're missing. Cause am I, th- I'm a, am I wrong to think like somebody like uh, uh, what am I thinking of like Zappa, like early yes. days, like um, or any of the jam bands? Yeah, I mean, did Neil Peart like back in the day use those or? See if you could or Google, you Google N- Neil Pert <laughs> Roto Toms and see if it comes up. Because I'll do things like that where I'll find like a saxophone lick that I love and then I'll go down and I'll I'll look right. up. And then there's always articles that will be like, the 10 best saxophone solos. Yeah. And then I'll go listen to those songs. He's a ten, the 10 best <laughs> Roto Tom fills. Yeah, we, yeah. Need to, we need to get that as, to be yeah. an article on <laughs> jamiechasta.com. Perfect. Um, was there any anything like that you got into like later in life? Because I, I, I Neil's f- Roto Toms. That's Neil's Roto Toms right there on the screen. Oh, there you go. There they are. Yeah. Oh yeah. So I'm gonna have to Perfect. listen to Rush on the on the on the way back. I'll have to listen to Rush and yeah. find the section where he's just wailing yeah. away on the Rotos. You Look up. It. Is does Roto have a, a a website? No, it's just a style of drum. Okay. So like Remo makes them, Tama makes them. Really. Uh huh. That's see, that's good to know. So meanwhile, I'm thinking there's like a barren company somewhere that like, right. closed down. Like fuck, nobody, everybody stopped using us. <laughs> um, somewhere there's <laughs> there, somewhere there's a uh, a sewage guy named Tom whose business Roto Tom is <laughs> yes. uh, really he's, he's feeling the pain. Sorry, that was a horrible. <laughs> that was a good dad joke. Horrible dad. Petruch with the. <laughs> I think last time you were on, I was like, does anybody call you Petruch? <laughs> Yeah, because <laughs> um, because at forty one, I'm going to be forty two in August. You know, some people have said to me, "You're still listening to death metal," and I'm like, "It makes me happy. Like, can't I just have one thing? Yeah. Like, I've already had to. Like, once you live with somebody or you have kids, like you you give up a certain amount of, uh, I don't want to say personal freedom, uh-huh. but like you know, me like I would have like a bunch of shit on my counter, vitamins, a bunch of, yeah. but I don't. I yeah. put it away because right, they don't right. want to see it. Yeah. Or I would have a bunch of stupid shit on my wall, Slayer posters. Right. But I don't because they, they want to have shit from like Pottery Barn. Right, right, right. But death metal, it still makes me happy. And I think, and someone said to me, well, you got to get into other stuff. So I'm, I've been getting into other. Yeah. I like hardcore still. I like thrash, I, you know, but. Basically, they were saying to me, get into other styles of music more. Yeah. And so I've kind of walked back my stance on modern hip hop. Like I've been listening to a bunch of modern hip hop and I've been liking it. Right. And I get it now because I think that when my band came out, there were older guys in the older bands that were like, oh, what the fuck is this? Yeah, exactly. And I don't want to be that guy. No. You you know what? I find myself being that guy sometimes. And, you know, and my family will call me on it, too, because... I mean, it just happened recently. Like, I don't know. I got a billboard thing. And it was like a Grammy issue. And I'm like, who are all these yeah. people? <laughs> and they're like, what? You know, you really got to expand your horizons, whether or not you like it or listen to it. You know, I, like I'm I'm in the dark a lot with stuff. And I, I don't want to be that guy either. You know, you're right. it's very easy to just be like stuck down your own lane. Yeah. And not expand or whatever. But for yeah. whatever reason, like we'll do it with food or we'll do it with a hobby. That's true. Like you could pick up a like. People are telling me, oh, I picked up golf. I yeah, picked sure. up jujitsu. I picked up this. And people are picking up all these new hobbies, but for whatever reason, with music. Right. You just like stay in your own lane and that's it. Yeah. I think it's it's healthy and uh, I should follow that advice for sure. I, I My nephew was listening to Drake 
and you know he made a good speech at yeah. the at the Grammy saying uh-huh. like look if you have fans yeah. or even if you're just a local hero right. you've already made it you right, don't right. need this yeah. and i thought Matt, wow that was really cool that he said that sure and uh, he had a song i think it's called energy uh-huh. but the song is really good and it, and it has content yeah like the song has a topic it's yeah. not just um, you know, bitches and hoes right, and whatever. Right. And I, even then, when I say that, I go, "Well, now you're sounding st- yeah, like really I, old and why'd you say that? <laughs> like judgmental, right? Because yeah. not it's that's a generalization. Yeah. Not not all the modern hip hop songs exactly. are like that. There are some that have content, which is like people could say the same thing about death metal. Well, why is it all about stabbing people? And you yeah, know? exactly. <laughs> why is it all about Satan? <laughs> right. Yeah. But do you like what is the I guess the the, the craziest thing that you listen to? Man, I I'm like I'm the worst. <laughs> I am absolutely the worst with music. Like I, I it's like I, I kind of like it, it's a weird thing where I've developed my musical taste like early on, and like those bands are still my favorite bands. And every once in a while, I get turned on to something new. But it's like I, as far as like actively pursuing that, checking new stuff out, and going out there and listening, it's like I I, I need to do that, man. I'm yeah, hor- I'm absolutely horrible. I admit, I admit it. It's it's put it's, me in put me in a uh, <laughs> a program, <laughs> a right timeout. Now. Yeah, exactly. A loud amps in the face timeout. Yeah, like. it's like I'm just like playing my guitar and cranking the boogie, and it's like this is all I need. I don't need to listen to anything. <laughs> I get that. I I'm like that. Some yeah. especially before I go in to do a record, I gotta shut it down. Yeah, like I just have to focus on my own stuff, and even if I like something but like listening to the romantics people would be like why the hell is he listening why to that listening to that but yeah. i'll air drum the shit out. what i like about you yeah you could air drum the shit out of that yeah yeah um but i i i will find that if i'm say getting into a band that uh i haven't listened to in a while mm-hmm. i'll go make a playlist of like all their jams that i really like yeah and that's fun and then you'll see when you know when you scroll down you'll see like the similar artists yeah so I'll check out, like I was just making an Entombed playlist. Okay. And, you know, someone said to me like, God, you're listening to Entombed again? And I'm like, it doesn't get old for me. Right. I love it. Yeah. And then it, when I went down, they had like similar artists and a bunch of them were ones that I hadn't heard of. Yeah. Some of them started with EN too, because there's like this whole, there's like they, they created sort of like a subgenre yeah. of, of death metal and hardcore. There's like Entombed hardcore and okay. Entombed death metal. Do you remember that pedal, the death metal pedal? Did you ever see that? No, I never saw that one. Oh, I dude. know the metal zone pedal. Yeah, the well, they they pedal. had they came out with their own death metal pedal too. I think it was a DOD. Nice, but um, but so there was a band Entrails. That's a good one. And I was like, what a great name! And I think <laughs> I played them on the podcast before because Metal Blade yeah. sponsored an episode or something. And but I went and listened to that, and I was like, this is great. And so you you have to just go out and search. There it is. Oh, it's Digitech. Yeah, ah, Digitech. Death metal. Someone, metal. I gotta get it. I know I have it probably in storage, but I need. It. I don't want to dig through it, so just send me a new yeah. one. If it's forty bucks. Yeah. Now this is this is one of those areas I, I self admit, and and it's like you know you, people say oh, you know you should eat more vegetables and <laughs> you really got to get your colonoscopy. It's like I, I'm like I'm so like out of the loop, With, you know, pursuing new music and. Uh, I got to do it. I don't know. Maybe this is the intervention. I think today. with with I some of the like that. with some of the heavier, techier yeah. bands yeah. that you've probably influenced and you don't even know. Um, I I did a uh, a countdown a couple days ago. Right? It was it's already up on iTunes. I think. I think it's out. Yeah, it just went out on iTunes. So I was reading through the fan email yeah. uh, for the show, and people were saying um, this this one band, Necrophagist. Mm. They were saying, oh, those guys became Obscura. So then I looked up Obscura, and this shit's tech. Like, yeah. it's these guys got to be doing fucking steroids to play this shit. I'm like, these guys must be jacked, but it's right. it's awesome. And, I, wow. and, and so you find stuff like that yeah. where it's there. it may not be a bunch of different hooks and sing-alongs and, and anthems, but it's a different, you're, you're getting into this technical heavy yeah. scary realm you know what it, and it's cool it's like i you know when we were younger and like getting into the kind of music that we like to play um and starting the, the band together there wasn't a lot of music like there i mean maybe it was out there somewhere in the shadows i don't know there's this band uh called watchtower from texas that were like super technical like ridiculous 
music and and uh the singer ended up being the singer for dangerous toys okay remember that band yeah and so you know and, we, and speaking of connecticut like we were buddies with the fates warning guys and yep stuff, but there wasn't really like this whole like technical prog metal scene or anything now it's like unbelievable the, the music that's out there that's you know and it's having a resurgence. It is. And it's like there's all these different subgenres. The players are amazing. You know, it's like reaching all different levels that are like beyond ridiculous. So like it's it's great now. It's a great time for all that stuff. And I I'll go and watch like shredders on YouTube and yeah. stuff and Oh, that'll that's mind blowing. It's incredible. It's ridiculous. The, the yeah. uh Joe from Fate's Warning, his son played in my project my Jasta oh, project cool. yeah he came to europe with me last yeah. summer and so the yeah, hearing his stories about yeah. all you guys playing together and the yeah, kids sure. the kids going to the shows and yeah, stuff yeah. was cool um but i feel like i feel like now with the crossover between the sub genres it's yeah. it's really helping like i i i find that more people especially with like, like this tour that we're going out on it's uh, it's hate breed obituary, Chromags, Terror, and Fit for an Autopsy. So it's kind of like two death metal style bands, right. and three sort of hardcore kind of crossover bands. Yeah. I find that you know you get more people saying, "Oh, I'm gonna go to a show like that." Yeah, that's that offers a little something different. Yeah, you know, from two sort of similar subgenres, but they're still different. Would um for the for this record when you. When does the tour start? So, and yeah, it starts on uh, March 20th in San Diego. So we're doing North America first. Okay, and, and yeah. what is the package? So it's the package is Dream Theater. <laughs> oh, it's an evening with. Yeah, it's an evening with. So we've been doing that for a while now. Um, we're kind of taking a page from the Rush book. Yeah. Uh, because we have so many, like the catalog is huge. It's so many of the songs are like really long. It's hard to play an hour, an hour and a half show. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we're doing so on this tour. What we're doing is we're focusing on the new album for the first set, mm -hmm. although there'll be some older stuff as well. And the second set, we're, we're uh, playing our record Scenes from a Memory um, in its entirety, which was our first concept album we released 20 years ago this year. And that's a, a that's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, as well. So it's kind of like more the evening with thing is something we've been doing for a while now. It'll be three yeah. hours. It'll be in that zone. Wow. It'll be in that zone. Yeah. It's a lot of playing. Yeah. Yeah. But we'll have an intermission. You can get up and pee. And okay. Because <laughs> I, I still think if yeah. there's any band that could do sort of like a modern mm. shed type of summer the theater tour, yeah. I think you guys could do it. Yeah. And, and these bands, I think, would line up, you know, these bands that are, have been influenced by you guys. Or if you went the classic route and got the, you know, the Fates Warnings and the uh, I mean, we've done both. We've done we've done tours where you know we've toured with um, Opeth and, yeah. and stuff like that. You know, we've done things with some of the the younger bands where we've had you know Triv Trivium or um, my nephew's band Periphery open yep. for us or uh, Between the Buried and Me. You know, so we've done that route and that's cool too. Um, it's a different type of tour. You know, the Dream Theater doesn't play as long, and you get to see a couple of different bands, which is also great. So I'm not counting that out but to start this tour we're kind of like we talked about it we're like man we, who would we bring and this and that we're like nah fuck it yeah let's just do the evening with yeah yeah so, no it's I, a tough I, call. I totally get it yeah. though i just i see with these sheds needing the nights filled yeah. i see some of the packages for the summer especially with the absence of a mm. festival type tour gotcha. yeah. and i and some of the bills that people are putting together i I think are pretty strong. Yeah. Like, you know, I saw Five Finger Death Punch is doing shows within this moment. I saw, you know, Breaking Benjamin is doing shows with Chevelle. But these are... That's great. These are, like, more modern rock sure. radio types of bands, whereas right. I feel for the classic bands, the legacy bands, and the bands that are more associated with metal and less yeah. radio yeah. rock, I feel like that lane is open. Oh, man, let's put it together. Yeah, I mean, yeah. hey, I might need to be a common investor. Yeah, and... <laughs> give me the perfect lineup and we'll talk about it. <laughs> well, and also, I think it'd be cool to, to, to showcase some of these YouTube stars Yeah, and, and give them a lane. Uh, Trivium did it with this guy, Jared Dines. Yeah, I know Jared. Yeah, yeah and, and mm -hmm. I think, you know, what he's doing is, is great. Yeah. Uh, and, and I also feel like with the algorithms changing with YouTube, the that business is going to change. And I wonder who's going to be able to, you know, turn it into a touring business sure. or, or some sort of other business. I'm sure it will. 
But I thought, yeah, that would be like if you guys gave the opportunity for not even like for them to jam with you, but right. just to figure out what their show would be. Right, right. And have that be like, you know, to have your co sign would be massive. That'd be awesome. Um, so what else did I have to get to? So uh, we talked about sequence in the album. Oh, the SN, the S2N. Yeah. That was tasty, that track oh, at the cool. end. I thought, also, I think it's weird now when you stream it off the Holix, I think it's called this. It, it, it wasn't on like, it's not out yet. So it's, oh, I so see. it's like a it's private a, link. I got you. So yeah. at the end, is there a hidden track or is that a bonus it's track? It's a bonus track. The one is called Viper King. Okay, so that's, yeah, that's after. Our, yeah. So that's our bonus track. Yeah, that that's our like car song. That's yeah. Our, that's our, that's our uh, Highway Star, you know, meets uh, Red Barchetta song about it's a car. cool. Yeah, yeah. So on, on the sequencing, will that just be the 13th or whatever It'll track? Be, yeah, so there's nine songs on eight eight songs on the record so that would be the ninth one so basically you know we were talking about like listening to an, an album like in its entirety and pale yeah. blue dot is the closer that's the big dramatic ending so viper king the bonus track if you listen to it after at the end that's kind of like at the end of the movie when the credits are rolling and they play the fun song yeah that's like that that's the vibe of that song so it's like a part dream theater's party song right would you close the show with it uh not particularly no. okay no <laughs> but would it, like yeah, what? How are you going to choose the songs for for the for, from this album getting into this? We set? already have it all all chosen. It's taken you know because we have to like prepare a lot with everybody has to learn the music and production and lighting and video you know so it's been decided for a while now. But basically, you know the the live show and set is very similar to creating an album sequence because you want that show to have to be an experience. You want it to have like a, an arc start out with drama and you know close in such a way that like wants people wanting more at least people wanting more and so that's this the set is designed that way as well have you ever been to a, another show like a rock show that had an intermission yeah i mean i've been i guess i mentioned it before like rush rush has an intermission that. yeah okay when they were touring yeah that's what they were doing for a long time you could know. you like could you bring one of those guys out like would you ever do that like i saw mastodon has yeah. uh scott kelly from neurosis like uh, just out with him and then uh, back in the day uh, uh we we had a night off in london and and uh queens of the stone age was playing and they invited us over to the show yeah. and they they had uh mark lanigan come out like have you ever thought about that like what if you what if you got yeah. like alex like oh my god that'd just, be amazing just come on tour bro yeah just, just, just come travel on. with us and you can do a little cameo yeah and you come out for like a block of like a rush um that'd be sick what do you call that like um a medley. A rush medley. People would lose their minds, right? You know what's really funny about you saying a rush medley? <laughs> but we like a while back when we were trying to like come up with set lists and stuff like that, you know, my oh, old Mike um would be like, Oh, we gotta do a medley. Old you know? Mike, I'm gonna call yeah, him that when he hits me Mike. up. <laughs> uh Mike 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 number one. Oops. Um he he would be like, We gotta do a medley of these songs and, and I used to be like, I hate medleys, man. <laughs> And so uh, he's like, it's like Rush when Rush did medley. I'm like, I fucking hate when Rush does medleys. <laughs> so we so we wrote a song called "I Fucking Hate When Rush Does Medleys." <laughs> no way. <laughs> yeah, it was never recorded. But you but you jammed it. It, it was only vocal. <laughs> <laughs> but but that's our, our song called "I Fucking Hate When Rush Does Medleys." So I I don't know the medley thing killed. I'm like, play the whole damn song. I know, Come but on. if but if you're if you're if you're short on time i know i know metallica does a medley that's that's pretty cool i there's there's definitely songs that don't age well in certain people's catalogs too where where you don't realize that it took like seven minutes to get to that one part yeah that you're yeah that you're you love to, yeah. yeah yeah so i could see in that case or or if there's parts like even in my band we we have songs that like people will say oh how come you don't play it well they, it just dies live yeah. Some some songs just don't yeah they don't hold up live they don't translate. Speaking of uh, the Queen movie, so their so their Live Aid thing was a medley, right? Right. That wasn't. Yeah, because it was twenty yeah. minutes. Yeah. Same as everybody else. They were meddling out. That was some some <laughs> cool camera work, trickery, Hollywood. That was sick. You know what the most impressive thing about that movie was? Just to get back to it, was the recreation of the Live Aid scene. Yeah. And the fact that all those actors. 
they actually did the entire 20 minute set they recreated the whole thing if you really? watch like the extras and the thing and and then I, it made me curious so i watched i went back and watched like the real one i was like this is they really went to the lengths to recreate that exact that's it, insane. They did a really good job. That's insane. I almost thought about getting the Blu-ray for yeah. that. I'm not like a Blu-ray guy. Yeah. I don't have a huge... I have a big DVD collection, but I'm thinking about just well, getting I mean, rid of it. Well, I mean, if you buy it like on iTunes or something, the, the extras come with that. Oh, so. it does? Yeah. Yeah, because when I when I saw that, it, they were promoting like that they got the rights to the, you know, to the footage to put as an extra. I thought, wow, that's, that's huge. And then just, just seeing... The sound scans, yeah. Like, um, I'll pull up one of them. Like, just this week uh -huh. alone, the Queen catalog. Oh my god, I can imagine. It yeah. is. It's, it's all over the place now. It's like everywhere. All of a sudden, every single commercial you hear, and everywhere. everywhere. Yeah. And then, the, and then it's right behind or right in front of, depending on the week, a Star Is Born. Yeah. Soundtrack. Yeah. And so I really, I hope that this is the start of something cool with. Maybe soundtracks coming back, or more music films Be great. happening. Yeah, because it does seem like there's more interest now yeah. than ever, like in music and in every genre. Yeah. I, I feel like there's more, like even from two years ago, I feel like there's there's more big theater acts and small arena. Absolutely, and, uh, not just in in rock, but even in country. Like I was, I went to the casino and and uh, to do a podcast. At Mohegan, yeah, and I don't know what the artist was. It was a country artist, but the arena was sold out. Yeah, that's unbelievable. And so the interest is there, but for whatever reason, we only oh. get these. Like we had the NWA film, and then yeah. the Queen film, and now I guess the Motley Crue film. I, I someone just sent me the trailer, but I haven't seen that. Have you? Oh no, I haven't seen it. Yeah, I guess the um, this actually this rapper that we know that we've played with a couple of times, M Machine Gun Kelly, plays Tommy Lee. Oh, wow. Yeah, and I thought, oh, that's cool, because he's kind of like a tall, tattooed-up kid. Oh, cool. um, oh, but, I got to see that. But uh, a friend of mine works with Mick Mars, yeah. and I I was you know busting my friend's balls because I heard that the, like, the most hated guy in Game of Thrones, uh, 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 I think Joffrey? it's... Uh, Ramsey, Bolton Ramsey. Oh, Ramsey, yeah. He, that actor right. plays Mick Mars. <laughs> really? <laughs> I supposedly. Hey. I haven't seen the trailer yet, oh, but I... Um, but if, if you were to do a movie yeah. about the dream theater yeah. legacy and yeah. career, who plays Petrucci? <laughs> it, it, it needs to be a wrestler, I guess. <laughs> Seth Rollins. Right? Oh man. I don't know. That's so funny. Are, do you bring out like a, a lot of gym equipment on the road? You know what, what? Got? We, we just like make sure that the hotels have a good gym and you know, if, if it doesn't, I, I become really adept at like finding one and going out no matter where we are okay yeah i'll go take the adventure yeah wake up early and do that yeah i uh, a buddy of mine's band there when they tour europe the singer just is like over the venues he just wants to go to the hotel and, yeah um you know the bus drops him at the hotel every morning or whatever yeah. but when i've tried to do this which i don't do it anymore yeah uh they always would give me a hard time about you have to like pay for the night before yes like what is that? Yeah. Well, th there's a couple of different schools of thought. Like, how do you guys do it? Do you all go to the hotel every day? Or we you... do, and we do the um, we do the night before, and then like afternoon checkout, like late checkout. Okay. Like three or four. And you don't have to pay for that. Somehow, our tour manager is God, and he does it that way. Some uh, other band, like we were touring on G three. You mentioned. Yeah. So Joe's band, like we would. They do it the opposite. So they check in that morning and then they stay at the hotel all day until the show. Okay. But so they might, get an early check in. Well, yeah, but that doesn't always work. So you so a few times we'd be like, I'll be going down to the gym and like having breakfast and they'll be like in the lobby all like disheveled with the suitcases, you know. Waiting for the head. I'm like, oh, you guys didn't check in yet? <laughs> Waiting for housekeeping to clean up a room exactly. to get them in. Yeah. So there's a couple those are the two ways to do it. We do it the other way. It works out better. Yeah. Yeah. yeah see, I, I, I need to I need to do something like that because I, I can't I trying to do podcasts at the venue mm -hmm. and trying to get somebody there like before sound check. Yeah. I've tried it so many times now with we're at this is what episode four hundred and thirty where it's like 
you you think you find one quiet spot and then that's ends up being the door oh, that like yeah. everybody's coming in and out of the whole I time can't imagine how you do that yeah <laughs> it, it's crazy yeah um but going back to the g3 tour what is the plan with that like would you do it again oh i do it every time they ask me i, I do it you know the, i think uh the ones i did last uh january you know actually you know through the spring was like my seventh or eighth time wow joe yeah I, I love it it's such a blast and it's i thought it was super cool that you give like these sort i don't want to I, I don't mean it in a, in a in a bad way but when i like an unknown mm-hmm. musician or unknown singer like you guys giving them the cosign yeah uh is, yeah. is huge i mean it's huge exposure right i mean joe like when we um the the u.s leg was uh me joe and phil collin from Def leopard and phil was unbelievable an amazing guy. Talk amazing about player. hits. Oh my God! Talk about hits. How many hits? There, there was one one day we were fooling around with this uh, new guitar piece of equipment, and it was in my dressing room. And Phil came came in. He wanted to try it, and there were a bunch of us around, and he was like really digging it. And he just started playing one Def Leppard hit after the next. We got like our private like Def <laughs> Leppard concert. And we're like, a Phil. medley. <laughs> yeah, it was a medley. <laughs> Phil, play pour some sugar up. Play photograph. Uh, but um. But the second leg I did was with Uli John Roth, so me, Joe, and Uli. And Uli had a band with him with a whole bunch of guys. And one of the guys, this guy Nicholas Tomlin, I want to say his name right, um, was uh, Uli's singer. Uh, And for the G3 jam, we would do a couple of songs that needed vocals. So we did Highway Star. And so Nicholas would come out and sing Highway Star. And this guy had like an unbelievable voice. Pipes, yeah. Unbelievable. But it turns out that he's also like this insane guitar player. And uh, so we'd get together during the day and exchange licks and stuff like that. But it got to the point where Joe was like, literally took his guitar off, handed it to Nicholas during the jam, and Nicholas shredded and traded with us. Yeah. And then the other guitar player playing with Uli was also this amazing shredder. And he would step in and play so I'm like, what is everybody just like an amazing guitar so. player? What the hell? Like, next thing you know, the, like the cook comes out, <laughs> the bus driver, you got shredding. You got to have some serious talent to be on that tour. It's that's crazy. That's, any, yeah. that's that's the way to go. Does it does elitism in that sort of musician world, like the fan aspect of the world, does that exist? Where like, does anybody kind of thumb their nose up as the at the guy from Def Leppard, or do they all like respect the, all, the pedigree? Totally, it's it's so the guitar community, like the the camaraderie and everything, it's it, it's ridiculous. In fact, recently um, Sterling Ball, who is the head of Ernie Ball Music Band, the guitars I've been playing for twenty years almost, um, he, he's a great musician himself, and he released two albums. His second one. He had all of his friends come on and play on it. So Steve Lukather, me, Steve Morris, Steve Vai, um, Albert Lee. Uh, and, and anyway, it's, you know, the title of the album and the whole band and everything is called the Mutual Admiration Society, which Vai coined because it's exactly that. Like there's so much love. There's so much respect. There's like a, and it's not this like, weird stuck up dicky thing at all it's like the total opposite that's so it's good amazing. to hear man yeah. that's amazing we need that in the heavier subgenres. Yeah. we need that because i feel like especially anytime hate breeds had any sort of look in the mainstream like game respects game you know what i mean like yeah. if you're if you're if you're uh doing your thing out there and yeah. people are reacting you know you like i met duff mckagan at the grammys yeah. in 2004 yeah and we've kept in touch since. Right. You know, he wasn't like, "Oh, who's this idiot with the baseball hat?" Totally. Yeah, he he was like, "Yo, yeah. you're doing your thing. Good for you." And but for whatever reason, like I when I post the death metal, uh, the 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 countdown, you know, some kids tweeting me about Whitechapel, and I'm like, well, "Yo, Whitechapel <laughs> will play circles around you, bro. Like yeah. respect it just because it's comes from deathcore. Or they don't like have long hair or they don't play a certain type yeah. of guitar." Like don't tr- don't yeah. try to knock it. You, no. you got to respect the game. But that's more. I think that's more people on like from outside looking in. I think more of the people that are in the industry together. It's usually like everybody's cool. You know. I mean, I remember Dream Theater did a thing, and for, like Poison was on it for some reason. We ended up hanging out with Brett Michael, the guy who's the coolest guy. You know, it's like he didn't care what kind of band we were. We didn't care what kind of band they were, and it's like in general, I found with like most everybody i meet or hang out with other musicians of the bands it's all cool and it's only like 
people on the outside making comments about you shouldn't be hanging out with this person or that person or endorsing this. It's all bullshit. Yeah. It's not the reality of what actually happens. It's not this weird, you know, hierarchy stuck up thing. I mean, yeah. Maybe every once in a while, like there's some weird band blood, but. Well, there. I think also uh, sometimes there's a there's this sort of the the way people treat older artists or like artists who maybe not ha- don't have like a mainstream hit uh-huh. in a while. Yeah. They go, oh, where so and so? Meanwhile, so and so is selling out theaters every year, yeah. putting out a record every year, and it's like, yeah. if you don't know, just don't. You don't have to be like that. And I find myself even I'll I'll be guilty of that. Yeah. Like we'll be like, you know, we'll talk about some band. Yeah, whatever I, happened to the right? We were talking about like <laughs> Candlebox, and yeah. turns out Candlebox is still killing the game. So I got to respect. That's so true. Do you know what I mean? That is so true. Yeah, um, big time. So, John, thank you so much for your time, and everybody, go and get distance over time. February twenty second. This will it'll this will air the same. Well, this is going to air tomorrow for subscribers, but when you're hearing this, you'll be able to go and, and stream it and get it, you know, or go and get the physical. Man, and we have a lot of versions of the physical that are really cool. Double we, album. Yeah, uh, not double album, but um, well, yeah, it would be. I think right. Would it? Well, you said nine, but I could have swore I thought it was like ten or eleven. It's but nine, maybe it's nine tracks. But I think there are two. Yeah, there so, are two records. Yeah, I feel like I feel like we need to hit the you fucked up drop about all that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> should I? Should, should we do you fucked up on the show? I think John's. I think John's got to go. Or we wanted to do. Oh well. We, wait. You have to choose your favorite rapper before we go. All right. So first, we're going to hear Corey Taylor with Slipknot. Okay. All right, Corey's got bars. All right, now we're going to hear Rob Flynn uh, with Machine Head. This is from the song Triple Beam. And there's no moral to the story. Read the lines in between. Because that's what happens when you balance life on a triple beam. When you balance life on a triple beam. <laughs> Rob going. Oh, wait, here comes the rap. I think we're gonna have to. Be, <laughs> we're gonna have to. We had Rob Flynn as my favorite rapper shirts. They sold out in like oh, five minutes. No way. <laughs> I think we're gonna have to make Rob Flynn as my favorite drug dealer shirts now, since that's what the song is about. All right, and then lastly, Chino Moreno from Deftones. What's this one called? This one's back to school. Back to school. All right. Oh, I remember this. This is a good song. And I think they were do. I think the label wanted them to do like a rap rock song. Yeah. All right. Like a body count. Yeah. He yeah. even had the ad libs. Like he had the ad libs doubled. <laughs> right. John Myung's a big Deftones fan. He's always cranking it on the bus. We're like, John, we're trying to go to sleep. <laughs> um, it's past my bedtime. Yeah. He's I getting got, you back for that. Yeah. Oh my god. I got to give it to Corey. I think the Slipknot thing I was, think that was the most happening. I think we're going to see we're you're you're the first of many guests who we're going to yeah. give this choice to because after after we did the Rob Flynn shirts, everybody was like, "Dude, you got to make Corey Taylor's my favorite rapper yeah, shirts." Yeah, yeah. So I did the design and I hit up Corey and he's like, "I'm down. I'm down. It's just got to go through, you know, the right. the process, the the proper protocol, but we're going to do it." All right. I think nice. I'm in, I think I'm in agreement with you, but we'll see. We got we got Shuli from the Stern Show coming in next. All right, cool. We're gonna put him through it as well. But everybody, go get Dream Theater's new album, February twenty second. Distance over time on on Inside Out Music slash Sony Music. That's so, it, dude. You got the 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 songs are incredible. Thank and you I, so much. I I hope that Sony really. I see all yeah, these man. other artists getting a Come push. On. Let's take it to the next level. I mean, you guys are proven. You're 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 a staple. I think you should call them right now. I believe me, I, I want to. <laughs> <laughs> hey, they dropped R. Kelly, right? Is, is that true? Or you're, you're no longer labeled. <laughs> so that's a that's a step that's in the a, right. Actually, a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> step in the right direction, yeah. John. Thank right. you, brother. That was awesome. Appreciate so it. Much.